Hi again, and uh, once again we're doing one of our periodic book reviews. A few weeks ago we looked at Stalingrad by the author Anthony Beaver, and today we're concentrating on a book he wrote a couple of years afterwards, Berlin, The Downfall, 1945. It's a fascinating book full of facts, and uh, he was able to research a lot of it from the old KGB archives in Moscow, able to go there and look at some of the documents pertaining to this assault. A <coughs> little bit of background, by 1943, certainly by 1944, the war was lost. The Allies knew this, but through the tenacity, I suppose, of the German high command under Hitler, who saw no surrender, and the Waffen SS, certainly pockets of them, the war was prolonged. Now, Stalin had always saw unconditional surrender, but he wanted Berlin. Only he wanted, he didn't want the Allies to have it at all. And through a series of devious means with the, um, Churchill and Roosevelt and so forth, he got his ways. The man was absolute gangster, but we'll come to him in a minute. But this leads up to the probably the few weeks before the actual fall of Berlin when the Russians came in from the east and down from the north and entered through the suburbs to get to the Reichstag. Stalin had the idea that he wanted the uh, hammer and sickle flag hanging over the Reichstag. And he certainly wanted it done by Lenin's birthday, although he didn't get it. So let's look at some of the photographs first of all uh, and get some idea of the background. Time Berlin had been circled, most of the Germans were starving by then. Uh, food rations were nil, nothing was getting, no fresh food or anything. A lot of the mains of water and so forth had been damaged. And here's a, the first picture in our book here. Here you can see German women out searching for the family meal. And you can see they're rummaging through the leaves. You can see the dry leaves there. And it tells us over leaf that they are looking for uh, chestnuts, which they would have used for a soup. Beech nuts in a wood near Potsdam. Now, all this had been decided at Yalta by the big three. And there you see the big three there. There's good old Winnie, Winston Churchill. Uncle Joe, as he was affectionately called, although he didn't like it, Stalin. And there's uh, one of the men or helped to build the New World Order later on, Avril Harriman, very powerful man. But there you see them dividing up the spoils of war of what they're going to be able to do. I say he was a gangster, uh, Stalin. I would say he was the worst sort of gangster, certainly worse than this man, Heinrich Himmler here, doing some target practice. And it says he seldom touched a gun, yet dreamed of being a military leader. But this man was an out-and-out -out criminal. And very interestingly, a photograph appeared a few years ago, which I'd like to show you, it's what we in the West call, I'll close this up, and I'll put it there, what we would call a mugshot. Stalin has he appeared on Osiris secret police files, an image of a dictator that would have found favour with Hitler. You can see those eyes there, those cold penetrating eyes, he looks defiantly at the Tsar's secret police, I think it was the Cheka. I'm going to have my way, and I'm going to do it my way. So the guy had a record, a fanatic, a man who dreamed of being God, and certainly the years that he ruled Russia, he was worse than a God. He was a tyrant, a terrible, terrible tyrant. I've always been interested in this book of what the state churches, what their role is, as the, the vice tightened on Berlin. Remember, no allies were coming in to save these people here. No police force. The army were out fighting elsewhere, and certainly not always around Berlin. So the women and the children, the disabled, so forth, were very much to the mercy of the marauding army that was coming. Three million soldiers, 62,000 tanks, fighter planes, uh, Smirsch coming up behind there, the secret police of Beria, the KGB, making sure and mopping up anyone who decided to leave or desert or anything like that. But what about the church? I can't find too much in this about the state church. Individual little churches, the pastor saying a prayer light and a candle and so forth. But what about the state church? When I caught up about the state church, I mean the Concordat that was signed in 1933. Here's a fascinating picture, tells you a little bit about it. Quite a rare photograph. We all know who this man is, but here's two of the key players in the game. Minor officials, I suppose, minor bureaucrats. Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop. I suspect that it's a New Year's Day celebration when all the nuncios and the ambassadors presented their credentials would have been to Hitler. And this gentleman here with the Dracula coat, or Dracula cape, I should say, is Archbishop Orsadigo, who was the papal nuncio. He got on very, very well with these guys, and you can see these guys looking at each other. 
him with his Dracula cape, little skull cap, and him with his Prince Ruritania outfit. It would be a laugh, really, wouldn't it, if you saw it? But very, very serious. These two work very much hand together. But what about the state church? Well, I can't find too much about that. Individual pockets of resistance and courage, I should say, by the uh, pastors of the small churches and so forth. But from the ordinary, the hierarchy, I can find very, very little. Now, as I said earlier, the big three had decided that Berlin was to be carved up. French section, British section, American section, Russian section. Stalin had other plans. He wanted all of it. And I think this is a fascinating picture. This is taken at Tehran in 1943, and it laid the groundwork that would later become Yalta. There you see Stalin there, never seems to age, always got that foxy look about him. Churchill expressed something. But look at Roosevelt's face. Look at those eyes, look at that man, miles away in thought. He's not even really there, is he? He's probably back in the White House somewhere. But this is the man the Western world was looking for, to fight this man. And at the end of it, this man got everything he wanted, the whole of Eastern Europe. He was voted out of office 18 months later, and he was dead. Fascinating picture there. Well, as the battle intensified, the troops are called out. Hitler had to start calling on the youth. And when I say youth, I mean the very, very young people. And there's a picture there of Hitler saying a farewell to young soldiers getting them ready to go and fight the Russians. And some of these kids are about eight and nine years old, but they were that desperate. But they're still looking up at there. And the whole idea, as I said, was that Stalin wanted the hammer and sickle flying over the Reichstag. And there is the famous photograph. Now, I've always thought there's something wrong about this photograph, and I know a lot of other people have, because the first question is, who's actually taking the picture, and where's he standing? And all of this looked very precarious, don't you think? This lone Russian soldier up on a sort of podium here, flying out the flag, and someone holding his left ankle, and that's about it. And as somebody once said to me, I think my son said to me a couple of days ago, the whole thing looks like it's been airbrushed in, doesn't it? That hammer and sickle rather looks back to front, don't you think? Well, they didn't get it up on Lenin's birthday, but they got it up in time for the big May Day Parade in Russia. Now, the whole idea of the May Day Parade in Russia was that they would bring the flag back, along with the banners, so forth, of the fallen armies and so forth, and have a big parade. And someone had the great idea that Stalin would ride a white horse, a pale horse, Sounds like the book of Revelation here, doesn't it? The pale horse. Well, it seems a week before, by then, Berlin was almost conquered. A white horse was got. And there you see Marshal Zhukov riding it. And the reason he's riding is because the horse, brave horse that he was, threw Stalin, threw him off. Zhukov got to ride the white horse. The white horse of Revelation tells us that it's the death, the horse of death, the pale rider, and he brings rape, famine, starvation, so forth. Following this man, Marshal Zhukov, who commanded three million forces. Good picture there of a German trying to steal a bicycle from Berlin. Many have never seen bikes. But what I'm saying is that these three million rapes, two and a half million abortions, not just Berlin, but the whole of Russia, the whole of Germany, when they swept through, we'll never know the full amount, but that's the amount that we've been given. All of this will happen in the Great Tribulation when it comes. There will be famine, there will be starvation, and where there's starvation, there's a search for the flesh, and this brings the whole rape scene in. Berlin, I would say, was a test case for what is going to happen there, a defenceless nation against the onslaught of the man on the white horse. Marvellous book. Try and get it if you can. There's our friend Marshal Field Marshal Keitel, who some say was born again at Spandau. American theologian says that. But I was very pleased with the book. It's a very, very good book. And all I would say is that when the great tribulation comes, the seals are opened, then you will see a horror and a terror. Nothing has ever been seen like it. From this ministry, from the fall of Berlin, thank you, and Maranatha.